Conference Time Lectures. Our speaker today is Professor Fred Kayward. Fred is the director of the Witz Mining Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand and also former head of school of mining engineering also at Witz. And as I can attest to, he is passionate about education, student development and responsible mining. Fred has served in various capacities at professional body, learned society, industry, government and international structures in the interest of responsible mining for national benefit. Fred has published internationally on mineral economics and mine surveying, mining law and policy matters, and he currently serves on several editorial boards. He is also co-author of two World Bank books, one on mining royalties and the other on transfer pricing in African mining. And so Fred is well qualified to talk to us about 21st century mining and flow of work, considerations for young professionals. Fred, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Tanya said, this is about 24th, 21st century mining and also having a look at what it means for the current and the future world of work and more importantly, how it affects young people who are thinking of having mining as a career. Hmm. Let me just get to the next slide. The, the structure of the presentation, I'm just going to make two points. The one is, what is this world of work? What is the future world, world of work for mining? And then how does it affect young professionals? And I do appreciate that there are some of us that are not that, but I'll include all of us into that definition of young professionals. Uh, the, 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 when looking at how to do forward predictions and how to look at the, 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 the future, you have to follow a structured approach. Uh, I'm not going to go into the methodology on how I got to the future that I'm going to discuss in this presentation, but it basically follows a structure of first of all, reading and to, to, to identify issues and then put the issues into trends do a trend analysis to see where the future is. For uh, then to look at looking at different scenarios, uh, and also uh, where if everything stays the same, what will that what what it will look like. So uh, in identifying these big issues, you have to read uh, reports. I have at some of the reports that I, uh, that I read in, in order to arrive at these. And I'm just going to, to read some of them. Uh, first of all, the world needs minerals and it actually needs a lot of minerals. If you look at mineral demand over the past 40 years, it almost doubled for commodities. So the mining industry is a good industry. It's a growing industry. The world needs more minerals. It's a good industry to make a professional a profession from. Then the, the other big issue internationally is resource nationalism. Uh, governments see it as uh, government participation. Companies see it as state intervention. Uh, but the reality is the state has a big say in mining and mining is, uh, is, is quite charged in the political economy. And one has to consider these issues. The next is the social license to practice that is getting more and more of an issue and is also getting more and more co complicated in its understanding over time. We are in a time at the moment when capital is particularly scarce. Uh, that brings issues of capital management and return on investment in a time of, uh, in difficult times when capital is scarce, uh, there's disruptions in mining. And uh, so capital management is also a big issue presently. Those are the cyclical issues. They, these issues come and go, but there are also some structural shifts that's busy happening. Uh, these are much bigger issues 
that affect long that uh, that affect the future very differently. It's not like cyclical come and go. These are things that we need to think deeply about because they're going to stay with us and it's going to change the face of mining significantly as we move into this 21st century. The first issue is climate change and carbon emissions and how it affects carbon rich commodities and the impact on uh, weather patterns and all these, these, these things. That, that, that can cause significant disruption to future production. Uh, then the two that are highlighted, that's the topic of this uh, presentation, those deal with the whole mine modernization drive and how to achieve mine plans in this change and, and, and also in this ongoing uncertainty on when to modernize, how to mo uh, modernize. And technology is disrupting mining, its future of work, it is disrupting everything. You know, in the past, over the past few years, the lower order jobs were affected, mostly the data collectors uh, and the operators. But as we go forward, it's the professional occupations, all of us will be affected by technology in, in, in a big way. And we have to incorporate technology in our personal value uh, add strategies uh, and our future careers. Uh, the last issue there is the issue of community poverty. Uh, that's a big issue in, 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 in Africa and how to, and companies look more and more at communities to look for future talent in order to get to buy some level of political stability at a mine level. So we're not going to go into all of those issues in detail. So I'm going to take the two that are highlighted in yellow. That's the topic of this presentation and project them into a future. But when doing this, we need to look at ourselves. And they say, and that is, what is our personal value proposition? And where, where's our strengths and weaknesses in doing such an analysis? Uh, so people form partnerships with companies and, and part employment partnerships. And it is not about how clever you are, or it is, it is really about what value you can add to the business. And that is the way that we need to see ourselves in approaching companies for, uh, for, 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 for jobs. Now, I've just taken the section of the mind map that deals with the future that's affected by technology uh, in this slide. First of all, if you look at this future where technology is heading, is that we are heading to a place where we will have intelligent machine mining. And that machine mining will be the main driver for value creation. Automation will happen. And uh, automation with remote execution of the mine plan uh, will, 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 will happen too. So the operator will not necessarily be next to the machine. This, but in doing that, we need digital systems. We need to connect these systems to the internet and to corporate offices. That makes companies more vulnerable to cyber attacks uh, and, and corporate espionage uh, in order to, when, 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 you, when you go that route. Then there's the issue of risk management. And this is, this is a 21st century skill because one has to be able to identify any type of risk and then have a, machine, a, a strategy uh, on, on that and execute that strategy in, in a way that it adds value to the, to, to the business. Uh, another future is uh, second. higher capital and insurance costs. This is a thing that, that, that's coming a long way, where when you have these advanced technologies that requires expensive insurance and high capital, in, 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 uh, 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 capital insets, then one has to look at the, the cost structure, which will be significantly higher. And if we keep on going the same way, it will certainly squeeze or sterilize some of our summer ore deposits out of the uh, pipelines. Then there's a risk of losing, uh, they, that brings a risk of, of, of earnings loss during mine shutdown, such shutdowns and disasters and other kinds of disruption, like the strikes that we had a few years ago. Another future is 
This, all these new technologies will demand new skill sets for mining, not necessarily new qualifications. Qualifications will have to be upgraded from time to time, but we have to start seeing the difference between qualifications and skills and the value that's added by skills on top of qualifications if you want to be successful in your professional careers. Then there are new workforce management approaches uh, and we need to adapt to this new world of work. And that has implications on 21st century curricula, skill sets, how to reskill, upskill, continuously skill. And then uh, for that, we need to reimagine the way we see qualifications and how to learn and uh, how, how, to, how we work. Going on to the next slide, I'm sure some of you have seen this slide before in some of my other presentations, but to me, it summarizes it very nicely what's busy happening. Things are changing. And you see in those four images on the 1900s. And then about 20 years later, underneath it, uh, gold mining on the Witwatersrand. Uh, then if you move to the right-hand side, the machines came in in the 21st, 20th century, and uh, especially in surface mining, where the environment leaned itself for mechanization and the machines got bigger. Uh, now we are moving into a new phase. We want to move smaller machines in the underground environment, but in order to operate them, we need some digital systems. Uh, we need some enablers. And uh, this is the phase of automation that we are in at the moment where we install a lot of sensors and systems in a mine, let them communicate, connect them to surface, and let the data flow into databases and mix with other information on the mine for decision making. So, and one can see if you go from the top left to the bottom right, how the environment changed and one can see then the skill, the impact on skills uh, accordingly. So, and we have to do that. We have to modernize in order to stay in business. Uh, the, so it affects the sustainability of mining. The technology affects the qualifications and the skills to mine. And then there's the community issue. Communities, if they want jobs on mines, will have to become more tech savvy to, 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 to benefit more from uh, mining in the future. And unlike 10, 10 years ago, uh, where these changes only affected the low order data collectors and the operators. Uh, these changes are now with automation start affecting all occupations. So all of us, whether professional, we're a professional technician or an artisan will have to adopt, to have to adopt these, uh, these and, and get these new skills as part of our skill sets. This diagram explains what happened with the world of work uh, in mining. It came to the, to, to, on, to, to the one on the left, that's the old way, where the workplace was in the center of the world of work. So uh, the workplace had certain specific deliverables that we had to deliver on, de deliver on. And then we had workers in the workplace, it's like here, and we gave the workers some tools, uh, part of the tools the skills, they gave the, the worker some job, and then the worker had to deliver on the deliverables. So it was a typical first, second industrial revolution model in order to uh, deliver on that. Now, in recent times, it's, it got more, more complex. We have more and more situation of worker-centered world of work, world, work, world of work. So now all of a sudden in the middle, where the worker was there, it moved to the center. So, so the person, I come into my job, I have a certain qualification. The qualification gave me the job. Then to do the job for that, I need skills. So I need that skill on top of the qualification. And then I have personal issues and needs uh, that I also take into my, into my world of work. So I am a person, with a job, then I have a role in that in the in that job. Then I get to the to to to, to when I get employed, I have certain expectations from my employer. 
in terms of career uh, management and progression. I need more training. I need lifelong learning. I need competence in what I need to do, what, what I want to do. And I need some tools uh, like software in so that I can do more and I can do better. Then when I have that, I go to my place of work. So here's the world of work. And the world of work is similarly to what we had in the past. They have requirements, there's deliverables, there are work processes. We need to know when we do our jobs well or not. So there's measures of success. And if we are successful, we can do more with less. And when we do more with less, we get promoted or we get a bonus, but there's some reward uh, waiting uh, for us. So it's a more, more complex uh, situation than the very simple one that we had in earlier industrial revolutions. The next slide. Uh, which is the second last one. So, uh, having a look at this, this future, future of work also, it's also of mining. Uh, the different occupations and the different industries are moving closer and closer together. The, the, to be an operator in a mine is no longer very different to be an operator in another industry. So, uh, the first issue that we need to that we need to deal with is longer life expectancies and it's very important because of the youth bulge we in in africa we have a young population there are more young people than old people the young young people are in the queue they are waiting for jobs while while some of our old old, old folks we are in those jobs and as things happen longer, life expectancy causes more older people in the workplace, which creates a, pro a problem for, for Africa. You, you want the skills, you want the, the experience, but you also need to look at the situations where are all these young people going to get jobs from. We, it is unacceptable to have a situation of jobless graduates. Anyone with a degree should qualify for a job somewhere. And uh, this is an issue that we need to be, that, that needs to manage. It's something for policymakers to consider very seriously because we need a solution for that. The next is intelligent production with machines working and sensors observing. So we will have more and more machines doing work and the sensors will collect the data for the machines to work. And we need to understand how machines work with sensors and how the data flows to people who must work and make decisions from, from, from all of that. That brings the issue of data rich work environments in a fast changing work. There's a lot of data that comes into a control room in a short time. How to handle that data is an important skill. How to put the, the, the data in the database and then how to extract information from the database so that one can make better decisions from, 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 from that data is an important skill in, in, this, in this world. And it doesn't help to make the, wrong, the right decision tomorrow. One has to make, when machines are in the workplace, one has to make the decision when it matters most, and that is in real time. Then workspaces will have, have information in the clouds and no longer in the cabinet next to our desks. In fact, we no longer have a desk. All of our desks have for the last two, three months have been at home. So the desk is no longer. The cabinet is no longer there. All our files, how to put it in systems so that all the information is at hand and ready to, 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 to use. Uh, then highly, highly mobile, skilled workers employed in several economic sectors is the next bullet there. Uh, skills are mobile. I just read a report uh, this morning of McKinsey on uh, skills migration in Europe. And they're talking about these hubs of professionals getting together. Uh, they call it rock star hubs. And uh, so where, where, where people with high skills cluster together and then it formed that cluster draws more people in, in, into that. And we're going to see more and more of that. In the past, 
it was through corporate offices where skills were clustered or, uh, or cons in, in consultancy firms. Now that clustering can now happen any place in the world. And that is something that we need to consider in our, uh, uh, in our future strategies. Also important for government, because if we don't form similar clusters, like for example, in South Africa, these clusters will be formed somewhere and then you have more of a skills or a brain drain as, you, as, you, as, as we come to know it. So it's highly mobile skills. And the, and the people, the, the skills are employable in several economic sectors, no longer just in mining. Now it's good for persons in mining, but it's also good for persons outside mining who will compete for the same jobs. And they might have a skill set that particularly appeal to, the, to, 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 to what, the, what, what the employer is look, looking for and their value proposition will be higher. making it more important for the person in the next the next bullet there is the marketplace is where one is and that affects the cost and the pricing of uh, skills so it's no longer necessary to go to a london metal exchange or to go to a market to sell a commodity and in fact in some cases the market is no longer there so uh, one so so one so and, and with Connectivity and the and the internet, one can do business from 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 anywhere, uh, and the and there 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 are skills associated with doing that, like for example the skill of attending this webinar, uh, that, that's an important skill to to take into a world of work of that nature. Uh, archaic management has no place. Uh, the nice thing about the lockdown lockdown, there is no management. Uh, not, any, not, not close to us in any case. So, uh, but that, 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 that's also a sign that, that the, the, the management styles ch changed over, uh, over time. And it's going to change a lot more when, when with people working on distance and in uh, a high tech environment. The world is watching. You can no longer hide anything. Uh, it's if governance and responsible business have become very important, uh, things like the sustainable development goals, ESG reporting, uh, the issue of transparent earth. Uh, these are this is important. So we we will we add value to the business by working according to those principles. The next the next point there is about humans building their own digital assistance to support their work. Now, that that that's 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 fundamental. If if we are lazy, if if we as humans are lazy, machines will take all of our jobs. It's just going to happen with artificial intelligence and machine learning. The the way we have we have to look at our strengths. And then we, ne we, we need to work. We need to improve ourselves to keep the machines as our assistants. In order in, uh, to, to do that, one has to acquire skills to use software. You have to become good at, 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 at different types of soft, soft software in order to do the job better. And then use the software as an assistant to you to do better. In, in, in your job. And we have, one has to understand this. If we can't allow something like email to take over our lives, then we are the assistant to email instead of email being our assistant. So, so one has to understand the roles and the boundaries between people and technologies very well and not be lazy to pick the skills up, to work on that, in order to keep the machines where they stay, and that is as assistants. Otherwise, the machines will become our bosses. The robotics and uh, the technologies are there. It's an it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a ethical issue that, that also requires uh, some, some, some debate. Human beings, and then there's the, 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 the other issue of how to compete with other human beings in the workplace. There's the machines, but there's also other human beings who are part machines. 
you know, it, it is possible to, 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 to plant computer chips in brains to enhance their memory, for, for example. Uh, and in fact, Elon Musk uh, claimed that, that they will do that, uh, uh, Tesla will do that before, if in, the, in the next few years. So that's a big issue. Because how do you compete with someone else who's a person, but that person has been enhanced through biotech biotechnologies, uh, and that person has perfect memory? Uh, because in the past, memory was the one thing that we didn't want to worry about because machines can do that better. But now that, that's, that's integrated into a human system. That makes it very difficult. So you have you, you, memory and creativity of that person at the same time, taking the advantage of humans away. So there's, a, there's an ethical issue here. This, it, it speaks to the limits of technology. Where should we stop? when it comes to technology. Where, 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 where's the boundary of ethics and human value systems when we, when we, when we do uh, these things? It's a very important debate. It is a discussion that governments must have at the highest level. It's an international issue that, not, that, that, that needs to be addressed because the power of technology and the power of artificial intelligence makes it a real threat if we do nothing about this. Now, skills for tomorrow. Oh, there are still two, two more slides, sorry. I, I, th I, I thought I uh, had one left, but there's just one and then another one. Uh, skills for tomorrow. Uh, this is, you, can, you can go on this website, cognizant.com, and then download the reports and play with the interactive charts uh, on, on, on your own. But it's, it gives an, interesting insight on what is busy happening. I've highlighted a few issues on the, on the diagram on the right hand side. 21 jobs for the future is that not all jobs will be high tech. Uh, someone like a walker, for example, will still be in demand. Now, I, I never realized it. I never, I, I, in fact, I didn't know that you have some people called walkers. I only saw it recently, uh, during the, after the lockdown, where I saw people walk, walking other people's dogs. So there, there are some creative things, and they're not always high tech. Yeah, no, yes, of course, there are the high tech quantum machine uh, uh, applications and uh, artificial intelligence. There are the high, but there are a range of, 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 of skills in between. Uh, like for example, how to use software, which is a 21st century skill. So it's not all high tech. So not all of us have to become computer geeks and software developers and masters of artificial intelligence. It's actually identifying how these things work and how it fits into the world of work and then give it a job in this world of work. Then if you go on the technology side, most minds have control rooms nowadays. Uh, the example in this, in this chart is highway controller, but we can see, read it as a mind controller. There's a skill that's required for operating a control room and to receive data into a control room and to communicate that data to the rest of, 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 of the mind. Uh, there's, there, there's another good one, man machine teaming manager. This speaks to how machines and people interact in the world of work. And in underground or in mining, it's more complex because there's an, another environment. There are rock, rock stresses, there's geology, there's, uh, <clears throat> there's environmental conditions like temperature, heat, ventilation. There are all these things that are part of the, of the excavation, the way where that needs interaction, where the data interacts. Uh, where, and the skill to, 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 to receive that data and communicate all that data is, is an important one. One that I find fascinating is the one on the top, real, uh, top uh, right, and that is Augmented Reality Journey Builder. Now, Augmented re Reality is becoming like a PowerPoint skill. All of us will need to learn that. If you're a geologist, how to use augmented reality to show the ore body in three dimensions. 
It doesn't matter what occupation you have or what profession you have. That is a skill that is incredibly important because we need to communicate complex concepts. And the way to do that is through, uh, through virtual and augmented reality systems. And it's very easy to generate these nowadays with cheap scanners that's attached to a cell phone or an iPad. Uh, uh, then there's 3D cameras and, it's, and, and the software is there to, there to do that. So that's almost like a PowerPoint uh, skill going into the future. Then on the left-hand side of the chart, the, if you read the reports, then they, there are three things that they highlight. And that's the importance of coaching, caring, and connecting as, as you go into the 21st century. So whatever job, whatever job you have, to be a coach, to care for other people, and then how do you connect to different people and how do you relate to the rest of your, to your workplace is, is, are, are like basic skills in the world of work. The final slide, what we should know for the future. We should know that some jobs will become redundant. For example, data collectors and observers. There are sensors that can do that more efficiently. We need to know that some jobs will always remain. And that's, that's teamwork, how to motivate people. We need, to, we need to know how people work with each other and how people work with machines and how a person communicates with a machine through, 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 through digital skills. And then also how to your know, machines communicate to people through data and then use and then use of the data for decision making. Technology is both a system and a competitor. So we need to use technology to build assistance for us. And if we don't build assistance, we'll become an assistant to the, to the technology. So it's our choice. Uh, qualifications and skill sets are changing. And because it changes so fast, relevant lifeline, lifelong learning is important. There's no template career plan anymore. We cannot plan 10 years ahead. It, just, it simply doesn't work that way with technology. And on a five-year basis, we'll have to reinvent ourselves. That's the way it is now. This might be more regularly as we go into the future. We need to learn how to do more with less. This is a life skill. And we need to, do it, we need to learn the skill in everything that we do. And it starts at home with managing our, our budgets at home. But that is uh, an, an, an important, that is how we learn how to add value. And it's our value proposition to, put to employers that will give us jobs as we go into the future. We need to understand the concept of value and value add, no matter how small the value add is. And we need to challenge the traditional. And I'm going to end this pre presentation by a quote from Klaus Schwab. That Schwab, uh, if you haven't read this book, you should read it. This is an amazing book. Uh, some brilliant insights on, uh, on, on, on the future. And a quote in the, in, in, from, from this book says, artificial intelligence and robotics will require collaborative governance as issues involve conflict resolution, ethical standards, data regulation, and pol policy formulation formation become priorities on the global scale. It needs an urgent global debate on this issue so that we can prepare ourselves for this future of work. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Fred, for that. Um, before I open up for questions and answers, we've got one chat question. What is, what is the book you just showed again? Oh, the book is, is called Shaping the Future of the Fourth Industrial Revolution by Klaus Schwab. Okay. I can, I can, I can email the, 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 the book details. But it's an absolutely an amazing. It's it's a few years old already. It's let's just see the date. But 
the insight and the discussion in this book is just simply amazing. All right, I'll, I'll, Fred, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we all appreciate that we're going through difficult times in the mining and exploration industries and we're, um, COVID, the COVID pan pandemic has just added all to the, all the uncertainty. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions and comments. I'd like to start with one myself. Um, we know that the, the Vitz gold fields um, have lots of resource at great depth. If we throw artificial intelligence at this at some stage, Fred, how deep do you think we can actually mine at and how long in the future is that? Thank you, Craig. The, uh, the, 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 the South Deep ore body is simply amazing. Uh, so the, it speaks to the limits of technology. We have to see where we are at the moment. I think at the moment we are mining close to the limits of knowledge. So it is necessary to do more research. It is necessary to understand the ore body a lot better if we want to go deeper. It, at some stage, at some stage we'll get to a point where it will not no longer be responsible to send humans down to those depths. Now for each mine that depth will be different. But when we get there, we must be ready for, to, to release machines into areas like that. So in short, do you think it's possible and it's going to happen? Do you want to give a time frame? I th look, if we can send crafts to different planets, and if we can do, do and, and, or, and most of that is done remotely, if we can do that, why can't we mine with machines, without people? Any other comments or queries? Unmute your mic and you can raise your hand if you like. I don't see any takers at this stage. Hi, Craig. I've got a question. Okay, here's one. Hi Fred, thank you very much. Great talk. We're all interested on, on this sort of conversation because it's impacting all of us. Um, you know, smaller mines have smaller environmental footprints, require less capital, um, and more attractive and regional centres. How, f and, and we, we, we're focusing a lot of innovations in the large scale mines and the big companies. How far off do you think we can mine underground narrow stopes, um, you know, high grade? Um, a lot of the mining economics don't stack up today for those deposits. So how far away do you think we can consider mining those um, deposits? And do you think that the startup capital would be too, too large for a lot of you know, small companies to be considering? Uh, the technology, the, 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 the barrier to entry to mine will be significantly higher if we go technology intensive. So the more sophisticated the technologies, the higher the capital barrier. That which means that not all mines will be technology, will, will be, will be uh, highly technology advanced. It really depends on this on the situation. There are some 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 deposits that are on surface, close to surface, that can easily be mined more cheaply using conventional methods. And this is, the, this is the exercise that we need to do. It's also in the context of Africa, you'll have to let's start look, look at how do you at the same time encourage uh, technology, but also preserve jobs. Uh, so we need, to, we need to find a sweet spot here, spot here. And the sweet spot might well be that for small, that smaller mines or smaller companies will employ more labor intensive uh, methods because they don't have the capital to start the high, the high technology intensive mines. But won't they be driven by the, you know, the cost of production? So, you know, if, if your manual mining is not competitive with, you know, some of the rates coming out of iron ore in Australia, it's just crazily low you know, $11 a tonne for iron ore, whoever thought that could happen. Yep. So it becomes a balance of what you can sell that into the market. Mm. 
So, sure. you know, I think um, a lot of companies, you know, when they look at the economics of manual mining, they're uneconomic. And that's what I'm sort of trying to say is can we get a cheaper method for narrow scope mining in Africa? Because there's, there could be hundreds to thousands of mines that could be mined if we could find a solution. That, 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 and I think the one, one, one sector that can particularly benefit from that is the artisanal and the small scale mining sector. Exactly. Uh, any other comments? Looking they're hungry for technology. Sorry, repeat that. Right. So so you 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 need the 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 the, the technology and you need different levels, different types of, of, of technologies. If it is a large surface deposit, it just makes sense to apply economies of scales and you're going to get your working cost down to, an, to, 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 to a minimum. And then you, it will not be possible for, for other companies to, 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 to compete. Uh, and underground, the situation is more tricky and there's more scope for smaller rather than bigger. Okay, before I close, any, any other comments, queries? Hi, good day, I've got a question. Carry on. Uh, this is Gabrielle speaking. Um, so I recently, I'm in the remote sensing sector and I've got a background in geology. And I was wondering how could remote sensing assist in automotive mining? If you could maybe elaborate on that. Uh, remote sensing can, 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 without remote sensing, we cannot automate. Uh, and we can, we can, we can start from satellite, from, 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 from getting satellite information and integrate satellite into the information uh, on the mine plan, in, into, in, into the mine uh, database, uh, on, from, from weather data to, uh, to, to, to geographic data, to, 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 to the, and then also remote sensing equipment on machines like laser scanners to find to to, to look at to uh, laser instruments to measure distance between machines so that we can have safe mining. There are just so 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 many uh, 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 remote sensing applications to o o autonomous mining. We have to understand it. we can never automate or think of a high technology intensive mine if we don't have certain things in place. First of all, we need to know the ore body a lot better than what we're doing currently. So our, our ore body modeling, our structural geology, our evaluation of the, of, of the ore body is very important. And remote sensing technologies can, can, can help with that. Then we need to understand our immediate environment. better if we want to reach risk, to scan areas, develop models, so that we can see what head of the machine, how the machines should react. We need to, we need to, we need, and, and uh, that's a, that, uh, uh, so there are just so many, so many uh, uh, examples of what needs to be done. Uh, one thinks of a machine can do the job, a machine relies on sensors, and that is where the remote scanning will come in. I can see this a whole bumper of sensors doing remote scanning and remote sensing in autonomous mining. Thank you very Keen, much, Fred. Keen, you've got your hand up. Yeah, Craig, Craig hi everybody. Um, Prof, thanks. Great, uh, uh, great uh, talk. Really enjoyed that. I just want to just want to answer Kelly a little bit better, I think, or a little bit differently. I think what you're alluding to is 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 you know from a remote sensing point of view, is probably what Prof is talking to there about, you know, in in future mining. You know, if we think about geology, we tend to think about uh, you know a, a flat ore body and these sorts of things. The complexity of the geology is going to become more important from a machine learning point of view. So, you know, these things like hyperspectral uh, uh, analysis, uh, uh, fundamental uh, understanding of the mineralogy of the ore body and how that changes and how it relates to gray becomes a remote sensing problem and ultimately a mathematical problem, right? Because that's where, that's what Prof, that's what Prof is alluding to here is, is, is this whole uh, machine integration requires those mathematical skills and, and, and analytical sets 
that mathematicians and remote sensing geos need to bring to the party to make machine decisions intelligent. Um, and, and I think there's a whole world of, of pain waiting for us there, but the technologies are there. Um, and, and from, a, and from a, 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 a just statistical point of view, I, I personally think that we've kind of like fallen into a, a creaking rut, you know? Oh, we want to know what the grade is, where is going to it? Well, you know, geostatistics is not just about uh, cridging or, or uh, conditional simulation. There are a lot of mathematical techniques that are available to us that in the mining industry, we are not even getting close to using yet. And I think we need to look at that very, very seriously. Uh, Douglas, you've got your hand up. <clears throat> Hello, yeah, I've typed in the chat my question there. I don't know if you can see it, Craig or, or Prof. Uh, I haven't looked at it so far. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the question was to Professor, you mentioned partnership and collaboration at the beginning of your presentation. Um, how does that work? Because it seems very difficult to get hold of the VITS um, Mining Institute. <laughs> so, you, so, so, do I you right. You want to talk about partnerships and you want to talk to the Vitz Mining Institute, but you can't get a hold of the Vitz Mining Institute. Correct. <laughs> Look, it's, 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 it's a hard question for me to answer. Uh, I, think, I think after the lockdown, it should be easier. Uh, the, it is, uh, we, we are in an unusual situation at the moment. Uh, so uh, it's only we have we started going back to VITS last week, and it wasn't very successful. Most of the students were turned away at the gate. So it is, it is, it is, uh, what, what you can send me an email, and maybe that's the best way to, 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 to deal with this. I, I sent Very you an email perfect. in February whilst you were on sabbatical, and you gave me someone called Masan Mabub email address and I sent three emails there up to now there's been no response from me. Fred, Fred yes, what is your email yes, address? Sir. Maybe you can give it out here. Okay, well, email. my email address is .kwit at vits.ac.za. Thank, thanks very much. We also chatted on LinkedIn. But, but, but our... coming back to the partnership issue, I, it's, that's an easy uh, easier question for me to answer. Yes, partnerships are very important. It is incredibly important to form partnerships because the skills or the, the, the range of services that must be required is so wide that one person or one company cannot do all of that. So, and then the way to deal with this is through partnering where someone can, can, can value add can add value to the, to, to the range of services that are required. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments before I close the meeting? Um, maybe if I may, uh, Craig, Kian here again. Yeah. Uh, Fred, just uh, uh, on, on that, that partnership um, question, I think you've raised an, a very, very important point in, in a, um, you know, that how do we manage performance versus control? And, uh, and I think, you know, we're the traditional South African way is very much a control environment. If you think about the structure of, uh, of, of how mining companies are, are set up, particularly, you know, at the coal phase. And, and one wonders what is the, you know, what is the change management process to change an industry, to modify an industry, to get away from, from that stoic uh, environment to a creative performance management in, environment. And, 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 and we've all seen the absolute dismal failure of, uh, of, uh, uh, of bonus schemes and so on in, uh, in, uh, in, in the workforce. And, and, and that's, I think there's someone, uh, you know, someone needs to spend some time thinking about that. I don't know if you have some thoughts on it, but it's obviously gonna be a tricky thing. Yeah. <laughs> Technology is changing like everything. It's like management principles, you know, to the, the to change management. It's such a good observation. It is, it is so important uh, because things will change so regularly and this, the change will be so deep and fundamental. Uh, that's where curricula 
in qualifications must respond to and 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 and, and self learning comes in after graduation in order to acquire these skills to how to manage change effectively uh, in uh, in such a fast changing world. Thank you. It's a brilliant observation. Are there any other questions or comments? I'll take one more. I don't see any any hands being raised. In addition, I see a hand from Kenya. I sus I think that was from that was the previous comment. Okay. Yeah, I'm done, Fred. Thanks. Okay, with that, Fred, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, I think this leaves us with a lot of food for thought and um, specifically what our undergraduate and graduate programs should look like in the universities. So thank you very much for that. I would like to take a final opportunity to thank uh, Dennis Blewett and Geo Explorer Store for sponsoring these this series of lectures in June. Uh, we've got another one coming up on Friday afternoon. Um, with that, thank you very much and I'll close the meeting now. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you.